Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another video of History by Podcast. And today I'm joined by a filmmaker, Semka Jacobovici. He is the author of several books, one of which we're going to be focusing on today, The Jesus Family Tomb. He co-authored it with Charles Pellegrino. And today we're going to be discussing his work on the Talpia tomb. Um, and for those who do not know um, who he is, he also worked on the, uh, the, t the TV series, The Naked Archaeologist. He was the host of that series. And he's quite well known for working on the Talpia tomb, which he postulates is the family tomb of the historical Jesus and his family, as he discusses in the book I just mentioned, the Jesus family tomb. So, so welcome to History Valley Podcast, Semka. That's a pleasure to be here. And by the way, I'll announce it today on your show. It's the first time uh, we're going to do a reboot of the Naked Archaeologist. So for all the fans out there, the, the Naked Archaeologist shall write again. Well, wow, that's amazing. I cannot wait to watch it. Um, so I'd like to start off with what what was the cause of you getting uh, starting your work on the Talpia tomb? Um, how did you find out about it? What made you curious about it? And what led you to the conclusion that this is the family tomb of Jesus? Um, you know, we're going to take care of the cat here. No problem. Uh, could you ask somebody to come up for? <laughs> um, uh, okay, so my cat here has opinions about uh, about my work. <laughs> okay, so it, it, I come from the world of um, investigative journalism. Like uh, what, what I've done is uh, uh, films about child sex trafficking in India and the Ebola virus. And and I won a bunch of Emmys on that. So that kind of uh, investigation. And uh, I really wasn't doing um, a lot of history and archaeology and stuff like that. But then uh, I was a big fan of history and archaeology. And uh, I, I was a fan of Herschel Shanks, who, the late Herschel Shanks, who I'm proud to say became my friend. And he was the editor of BAR, Biblical Archaeology Review. And, uh, and we befriended each other. And uh, he, he said, I have a documentary for you, because that's what I do. I make doc film, documentary films, investigative ones. It's the biggest story on planet Earth. They found an ossuary with the inscription, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. And if this is the James and the Jesus, then this is the first time carved in stone, but not a text, an actual uh, archaeological uh, find that attests to, to the existence of Jesus and the brother, the family, Joseph, and so on. And uh, long story short, I've I got that story, and I, it was a huge scoop. It was front page news all over the world, and uh, it was called the, it's called the James Ossuary, and then it became very controversial because some people uh, argued that even though the ossuary, for those who don't know, an ossuary is a bone ball. It's a coffin basically for just the bone, and for those, so it became very controversial because. The ossuary, the naysayer said that the ossuary was authentic, and the first part of the inscription, James, son of Joseph, was authentic, but the words brother of Jesus were added in Aramaic, in Aramaic, uh, by the owner of the ossuary, this collector. So this became a huge story, the James ossuary. He was charged with fraud, the owner, and there was a trial, he was vindicated. Uh, me and Herschel Shanks were the only ones that stood by the him and the authenticity because I was there. I saw all the tests that were done on it, on the patina and so on. So um, that's that film, the 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 brother of Jesus film, got me into this whole world of biblical archaeology, uh, archaeology generally, and biblical archaeology specifically. And I realized that in this world, 
there's no investigative journalists. What there is is a filmmaker. You know, when when an investigative journalist asks a question of a president of the United States, he can be an or she can be a confrontational, ask hard questions. Uh, they ought to be. But when dealing with professors of history and archaeology, the filmmakers were very, uh, oh, yes, professor, yes, professor, you have a PhD professor. So I thought, wow, there's a, there's a vacuum here uh, of using the tools of investigative journalism. And I also have an academic background, but using the tools of investigative journalism in the world of archaeology and biblical archaeology. And I haven't, you know, it's been several decades, I haven't looked back because uh, I, once I got in there, and I, I, th I thought, wow, there's all the amazing stories that people aren't covering because they're afraid that they'll be, you know, criticized or they'll do, they won't get tenure at university or whatever. And that's how I got involved in, in the Jesus family through, through the brother, James. And uh, speaking on the James Ossuary, um, you know, some will say that the James Ossuary was removed from situ, and they'll say that that's the that's the problem. And and uh, I know that um, there's an argument, and I know that this was where this is going. That the James Ossuary is the missing ossuary that was that that was taken out of the tomb. Could you talk about that? Yeah. So I got into the whole Jesus family tomb in the section of Jerusalem called Talpiot when I was making the James Ossuary film. And so let me explain. Um, first of all, we have to understand that all these ossuaries, like when you, you know, I live 40 minutes from Jerusalem. When you, when you build a house in Jerusalem, you're gonna hit archeology. span If you wanna put up condos, you're gonna hit archeology. span uh, The, 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 I mean, and then, and then there's a whole protocol. You have to call the Israel Antiquities Authority and so on. So um, it, if when you read in, I remember as a kid, even as a teenager, when I read in the Gospels, I'm Jewish, I'm an Orthodox Jew, but as an educated human being, I wanted to know about Christianity and I learned and I read the Gospels. And I remember being very surprised about Jesus's burial. Why? Because Jesus, Jews bury their dead very quickly, like same day or within 24 hours. Uh, and then there's a whole mourning period of seven days and 30 days and a whole year. There's a whole protocol, so to speak, of ritual of what happens when somebody dies. And the Jews bury their dead in the ground from dust to dust. Uh, in those countries where you're allowed to not wear and not put a casket, you actually just wrap the body in, in a shawl, a prayer shawl or a piece of material, and you don't put it in, in a coffin as such. So I was, all, I was surprised that the, the, the gospel's description of Jesus's burial. After all, he was a Jew. The gospels call him rabbi. Mary Magdalene calls him rabbi, rabbeinu, my rabbi, in the gospels. Uh, when she sees him after the, um, the after the description of the resurrection she comes she sees him she calls him Rabbeinu. Um, he was he lived 2000 years ago in judea you know the country of the jews uh, he never left israel you know judea so why is he buried in this funny way that he's i thought that he's put in a cave like in, and then there's a stone rolled in front of the cave and then all that stuff. I didn't know as a teenager that that's in fact, it's the best description of what they call secondary burial that there is anywhere is in the gospels. What do I mean by that? I mean that there seemed to be this kind of fad in, uh, in, in um, around Jesus's lifetime, just about 30 years before he's born and until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD CE. So be, from 30 BCE to uh, 70 CE, for about 100 years, there's this thing happening in Jerusalem and in the Galilee, the two places associated with Jesus, where people don't bury their dead. Jews don't bury their dead in the ground. Rather, they bury their dead in a tomb. 
or a cave that's that's become a tomb uh, because according to Jewish law the cave counts as in the ground and and uh, they 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 put the body in the cave they waited for a year you know, they shrouded the body as you do with all bodies they waited for a year uh, until the flesh desiccated and then they gathered up the bones and put the bone in a secondary burial in a bone box uh in called an that we call an ossuary today and and, and that's you, you can go into a tomb today in jerusalem that they find from two thousand years ago and uh you know there'll be five six ten ossuaries the whole family these these tombs become family tombs and some of them, about 20% of them, have inscriptions on them. They're not monumental inscriptions. They're not inscriptions for, you know, like in a monument where you, for people to see and, and admire. But they're, you know, aunt so-and-so, uncle so-and-so. They're for the family to know who's in the bone box. So you, you put the bones in a bone box. The bone box is usually the size of the femur bone, the longest bone in your body. So there's bigger ossuaries, there's smaller ossuaries, and 20% of them uh, have inscriptions on them. And the best description is exactly what you read in the Gospels. That actually happened. And they're self-dating, because if you find a tomb, you don't have to do carbon-14, because it's more accurate. Carbon-14 always has some leeway this way and that way. But here, you know, if you find a tomb, it's, from, it's in that 100-year period before the destruction of Jerusalem, the Jews did this kind of burial, secondary burial in Osiris. Now, why did they do it? People don't exactly know why, but it seems that it was like resurrection fever. People thought it was the end of days. Judea was then occupied by Rome, an imperial pagan power. The Jews saw, thought, how could God let this pagan and ruthless you know, regime rule over jerusalem it must be the end of days the messiah will come any moment and and uh and liberate uh the jews specifically humanity generally and you know usher in the end of days so by by putting all your bones in a bone box you kind of had a front row to the resurrection to the end of days to the apocalypse when that came all your bones were together so you could really you can you could stand up and with your new body and and be there, and the, and it was only the rich that uh, or, or you know people that had money because it cost money to get a, a tomb and to do all of this and generally what you see them is you see these um, uh, so if you're a religious leader you could do it because you had a following everybody chips in and you know and in the gospels it says that Joseph of Arimathea and he goes out of its way to say a rich man took the body of Jesus and buried it. So he, he, um, he had a tomb. And it says in the Gospels that he gave Jesus his family tomb, the tomb that he had prepared for his own family. And it had been, you know, virginal. Nobody hadn't been used. And he put Jesus in it. So, so they have found uh, hundreds of these tombs in Jerusalem. Every time they build a building, they find a tomb, more or less. Uh, and specifically in certain areas like Talpiot. Why Talpiot? Because it's, like a, it's, it's a hill and it's overlooking the Temple Mount. So you kind of saw the, the, the house of God from there. You saw that it was a great view for the uh, end of days. And they find these tombs, and in these tombs there's ossuaries. They found, I think, at least 3,000 ossuaries already. And as I say, 20% of them have inscriptions. So you, in a sense, have a telephone book, right? Of Remember, Jerusalem wasn't that big in those days. It wasn't Manhattan. So if you find thousands of ossuaries, you, you actually can, it's, you know, as I said to somebody once, it's easier to find... You know, the uh, my family, my parents are from Romania, and the Jewish cemeteries there were destroyed by fascism and Nazism. So it's easier to find a tomb in Jerusalem from 2,000 years ago 
than it is to find my grandfather's uh, 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 some you know tombstone from from you know like a hundred years ago like you, you just it, it's easier you actually have access because these tombs survive unlike burials in the ground they don't survive the little headstones disappear as people build over it and so on tombs survive and some of them in perfect condition so uh as i was doing this um documentary on the brother of jesus the ossuary that was found and as you say, it wasn't found in situ. It was, which means in its archaeological context, it was bought in the antiquities market in Jerusalem by a collector. Uh, you can go today to Jerusalem, the old city, and buy yourself an ossuary. And some people do because it's a box. Uh, if the bones have been taken out of it, which by the time it's in a store, the bones have been taken out of it, people use them as planters, you know, like... Uh, uh, you can you can buy an ossuary, and this particular uh, collector, Oded Golan, bought one because it had an inscription. They're more rare than the ones without inscriptions. And Andre Lemaire, an epigrapher, an expert on ancient writing from Sorbonne, the elite university in France, saw it one day and said, "Oh my God! You know what it says here? It says Jacob, which is James in English." son of joseph brother of jesus of yeshua and joshua in hebrew and aramaic and jesus in english uh, so the question arose could this be uh, the brother of jesus and where did this ossuary come from where did it come from because if it came from a jesus family tomb maybe you know, maybe the Virgin Mary's ossuary is there. Maybe, who knows, you know, maybe Joseph's uh, ossuary is in there. So I was interviewing an expert at the Israel Antiquities Authority, uh, an archaeologist, and he mocked me for being interested in the brother of Jesus. His, his point of view was that these are common names in first century Judea. Joshua, Jesus, uh, Joseph, these are common names. And, he, and in mocking my interest, he said, behind him, there were like a thousand ossuaries on shelves because, you know, we set up the interview. It was like uh, in, Indiana Jones, you know, the last shots, uh, like this warehouse full of archaeology. And he said to me, why are you interested in the brother? Why don't you go for the man himself? We got Jesus in him. And he, he meant it as a joke. Like, we don't really have Jesus, but we have people named Jesus. Uh, so I said, I was naive. I said, really? You have a guy, you have an ossuary that says Jesus on it? And he said, yeah. So I said, can you show it to me? Because, you know, I'm a very simple person. All the, A lot of these people, you know, I never finished my PhD, and I'm happy because you get really sophisticated when you get that doctorate. I'm very simple. I ask very simple childlike questions. Can you show me the ossuary where it says Jesus? Yeah. So he took me and showed me the ossuary. It says Jesus. And I looked at it, and sure enough, it says Jesus, son of Joseph on it. But then I felt stupid. I thought, wow, there might be a hundred ossuaries here without inscription. It's totally meaningless. And I asked him, how many ossuaries like this have you found? Thinking he's going to say like a dozen, you know. But he said one. And I said, really? And I looked next to it, and I see another ossuary from that same tomb. And it says Maria on it. Maria, Mary. Like an Ave Maria. Like actually Maria. And you can, any child in Israel who can read Hebrew can read the letters. You don't need an extra. Clear letters. And I'm saying, oh my God, from the same tomb? And, and then I look and I see... Josie, and we know that one of the nicknames of one of Jesus' brothers, according to the uh, Gospels, is Josie. It, it's spelled J-O-S-E-S -S in the King James Version. And it's a nickname. It's not a compliment. It's actually a nickname. And there it is, inscribed. My jaw dropped, and they're all from the same tomb. And I said, where is this from? He said, tell me. And I said, has this been published? No. Like, does anybody know? And he says it doesn't mean anything. I said, really? He says, 
a lot of people were called that. I said, have you ever, you're an archaeologist, have you ever asked a statistician what are the odds that this cluster of names would be in the same tomb? No, no need. So that's how I became involved. I spent many years investigating the tomb. I, I refound it. I inserted, I, I entered it. I filmed in it. I tracked down the ossuaries. I, I had experts in statistics. And what can I say? It's the Jesus family tomb. There's no question in my mind. Now, if some, you know, in a peer reviewed leading statistical journal in the world, the statisticians said this is 1500 to 1, the, the tomb of Jesus and his family. Now, if a believer that doesn't want to believe that Jesus' body you know, was left behind on earth, if you, um, ascended to heaven, says, I don't care if it's a million to one offense. I believe in the one and not in the million. I respect that. Maybe he's right. He's right. Maybe the one is right and the million is wrong. But I'm a filmmaker and a journalist, and I can just report the odds of this tomb, Alpio, that was found in 1980 with this cluster of ossuary in it, is like at least 1,500 to 1 for it being the tomb of Jesus of Nazareth and his family. And when you go into the tomb and you look inside it, you look in the front of it, you look inside it, and you look at what the Gospels uh, say about uh, the entombment of Jesus, what other similarities do you see there? Well, I see a lot. There's been rolling stones found in front of uh, entries. There's been, uh, I mean, the Gospels give a very accurate description of the, remember, Jesus is buried twice in, in, uh, in, in no, Jesus is in the Gospels. Joseph of Arimathea takes him down from the cross, and then he's buried. And then people come, uh, specifically the women folk come to, uh, because it was a Sabbath, they buried him quickly after the crucifixion, and then they want to come and tend to the body. And that's normal, to wash it properly, to clean it, and to prepare it for, um, you know, for, for like a proper burial, so to speak. Because the Sabbath was coming, and he was crucified, and they didn't want to leave him over the Sabbath on the, on the cross. So Joseph Arimathea asked the Romans, can we take the body? He's dead. And they buried him. But when they come, the women folk come, that's a Friday. When they come on the Sunday, the rolling stone has been removed and it's empty. The tomb is empty and the rest is history. Right? Jesus, uh, Christians, of course, believe that Jesus was resurrected. He was seen. He then subsequently ascends to heaven. Um, all that, all the. All the description of the burial, that there's a, a cave, that there's a rolling stone, you see that. You can enter, you know, I've crawled in many a tomb, and um, you see it with your own eyes. Um, uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, of course, was built over a tomb. That Christian tradition says that's the empty tomb, that's the tomb that he was buried in. Um, and uh, today, of course, it's very hard to see the original cave so much you know, so much building has happened over at the church, I mean. Uh, but even in the back of the church of the Holy Sepulchre, there's the remains, for those who know where to look, of a little cemetery, so to speak. And there's other tombs, and you can crawl into the other tombs, the tombs that are supposedly not the tomb of Jesus, and uh, and see what a first century Jewish tomb looked like in Jerusalem. What do you make of the uh, one of the other ossuaries that was found in there? Um, a, a Yehuda ben Yeshua, uh, Judas son of Jesus ossuary. Would you say that's a indica indicative that the historical Jesus had a son? Of course, I would. <laughs> if you hmm. find a tomb, a family tomb, and there's a man there named 
buried there named Jesus, which there is. There's an ossuary that says Jesus, son of Joseph. And next to him, there's another ossuary that says Judah, son of Jesus. The logical conclusion, these are family tombs, right? So I would think that it's the, the person, the uh, Judah died as a child because if he was all grown up and married, and remember they're married very young, um, and they had children, so he would be in his own family tomb. If Judah, son of Jesus, is the same tomb, there's three generations there. There's Joseph, Jesus, son of Joseph, and Judah, son of Jesus. So he must have died at least before he got married and established his own family. So he would be the son. Um, also, there is, all of them are written in Aramaic. All the inscriptions are written in Aramaic. There's a Matthew in there. Uh, these inscriptions, Aramaic is a kind of, um, it's like it's like a kind of uh, Hebrew, you know, slightly same family, same letters, use the same letters. Uh, Jesus, of course, um, spoke Aramaic like all Jews at that time in Israel. Hebrew was an elite language. It was, uh, it was used, it was a liturgical language, but in, in the market, they probably used Aramaic. Remember, even in the Gospels, Jesus says a famous line in Aramaic. When he's crucified, he looks up to heaven and says, my, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? But he, the original is, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. And that's in the Gospels, in the Aramaic. Um, so um, they're all in, all these ossuaries are in Aramaic, except one. One is in Greek. And what it says is a name is a specific version of Mary. So there's two Marys in this tomb. One is Maria, which fits the tradition of how uh, Jesus's mother, the, the Virgin Mary, is known as uh, Maria. And the other one is Mariamne Emara. Mariamne Emara. It's in Greek. This version with an extra E of Mary, it's a Greek version of Mary, Maria Mene. There was a Maria Me, Maria Mene who was a princess. She was married to Herod. She was a Hasmonean. It's Hanukkah now. And the Hanukkah celebrates the Mac Maccabees. The Maccabees set up, you know, a kind of ruling uh, aristocracy. And one of the daughters was called Mar Mary in Greek, Maria, Maria Mene. Many, but this particular spelling of Mary in Greek is identified with only in all in the entire body of Greek literature associated with only one woman, Mary Magdalene. So we have a unique spelling of Mary Magdalene's name, and coincidentally, it seems it's found in on an ossuary in this world next to someone called Jesus son of Joseph. So now, why would a woman be buried in, in, uh, in a tomb? Well, she would be normally with her husband. Uh, she wouldn't be a sister. Uh, she could be a mother, like Maria, but she wouldn't be a sister. A sister would be married, uh, married with her husband, and her, her, you know, her family. So I assume that this Mary Magdalene was married to Jesus. That's what the evidence, the forensic evidence suggests that Mary Magdalene was married to Jesus. They had a son named Judah, his one son. And they're all, they were buried in this family tomb. That's fascinating because that, 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 that seems to fit what much later Christian sources, which is text that scholars tend to dismiss as nonsense. But much later legend that suggests that Jesus had a family and had children. Well, and that seems to fit. Well, there's there's lots of texts called by scholars the Gnostic texts, you know, with a G, G N, Gnostic, Gnostic texts. So that's kind of these texts are usually um, dismissed as you know as kind of alternate Christianities. Uh, but we have to remember something. What makes something an alternate Christianity? Well, there were lots of Gospels, right? If I knew Jesus 2,000 years ago, I could write my own Gospel. 
Gospel means the good news. So if, if I'm one of the 12 disciples, let's say, or even just a follower or bystander, if, 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 I, if somebody came to the conclusion that Jesus was important, that he was the Messiah, or, or even, even he wasn't the Messiah, he was a great revolutionary, a great rabbi or whatever, they could write the story of Jesus, right? They could say, I saw him, he carried the cross, I heard him lecture, you know, he healed people, he was amazing. It happens all the time, then and now. His followers of rabbis today in Israel, in Jerusalem and then the Safed, you know, all over that their followers write gospel, so to speak. They write they write the stories of their revered rabbis. Now, there were hundreds, according to scholars, there were hundreds of these gospels circulating. But then comes Constantine, a pagan, a Roman emperor, right, in the fourth century, and he says, I don't like this. This is not good. Let's convene a big council, the Council of Nicaea, and let's decide which are the real Gospels and which are the Gospels that we don't believe in. And that's what they do. They pick four Gospels that fit with their ideology. And whose ideology? Rome's ideology. Remember, who's the, who at, the, at, the, at this council is the powerful person? It's the emperor. And he's not a Christian. He's, he's a pagan. And he's not interested in Jews or Jesus. He's interested in Rome, in Roman power. And he says, these four Gospels are like. Now, why would he like one Gospel or another? Well, think about it. The Romans crucified Jesus. If there's a Gospel running around, that makes them look bad, he wouldn't like that one. If you look at the present gospel, the four gospels in the, in the Christian Bible, the Romans are good guys. They crucify Jesus, but the Pontius Pilate feels bad about it, you know? Like, it, it, it's a topsy-turvy world where the Jews say, crucify him. Like, what occupied people ever say, I'm on the side of the occupier, I'm on the side of the crucifier. Right? It's, it's, but anyway, those four gospels are chosen. What happens to the other gospels? Well, they're either burnt, hidden, encoded. It, it becomes secret stuff. I mean, you, you can feel it now in America. People write in code. It's a world where if you go against certain woke principles, you're not going to get a job. So you, you're either self censor or, or you, you write in code. Well, these encoded Gospels are showing up. They're showing up. Gnostic Gospels, they're, they were found in Nag Hammadi in Egypt in, in 1947. These other Gospels are found. And in these other Gospels, Jesus kisses Mary Magdalene. Uh, you know, it, it, they have a different relationship, an intimate relationship. I wrote a book with uh, Professor Barry Wilson called uh, you know the lost gospel it's an encoded gospel it says it says clearly that they were married and that they had children so again if that doesn't fit with some christian theology i totally respect it i'm not there to convince or not convince but i am there to report and what i'm reporting is that the idea that jesus was married is was certainly not a radical idea in the first century. What would be weird if it was he wasn't married? Remember, a rabbi is not a priest. There was no Christianity. He's called rabbi in the Gospels. A rabbi is supposed to be married. He's supposed to create a family to act as a example. Talk about family value and as an example to his congregation. So, if Jesus wasn't married, that would be kind of unusual. So I think both are, I think archaeology, textual evidence, and tradition says that Jesus was married. And if he was married, he had children. And in the Talpio tomb, we find the wife and we find the child. In fact, I actually have, uh, I've, I've interviewed Barry Wilson before um, on the Lost Gospel, a uh, book that y'all worked on. Um, yeah, people should wanna, people should rush to their computer and order those books. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I'll put the I'll, yeah, yeah I'll put the link to the Am to the History Valley Amazon affiliate link to the Jesus Family Tomb and to the Lost Gospel in the description below. So go check it out, everybody. Um, but there's a couple more things I'd like to touch on uh, before we uh, close. Um, Matthew, you mentioned a Matthew in the tomb earlier. What do you think about that? Do you think that could potentially be Matthew the Evangelist, perhaps? It, it could be. I think that's that's the other names, you know, are like Josie, Yosef. We know that there's a brother, Yosef, right? Um, and uh, so the other names we can easily um, connect. Matthew uh, uh, is 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 a more complicated, more complicated ones. But I think as we deal with the book, there are candidates for who. Or who that Matthew may may be, you know, Matya. So I think I think he makes sense. Uh, it, it doesn't surprise me that there's a Matthew there. We didn't include him in the statistics of the cluster. And the other thing that happened, the, the big reveal, is that after my book uh, was written, after me and Charlie Charles Pellegrino wrote the book, and then I wrote another book on the Stalpio film with James Tabor. There's two books on the, on on that subject. Uh, you know, famous professor James Tabor, as well as Barry Wilson, famous professor. Um, you know, when when um, when you when you look at all the evidence, right? It becomes a statistical slam dunk. If you could include the James ossuary in the cluster, so remember where we started this conversation. A ossuary showed up in the antiquities market and was sold to a collector. And it says, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. But we don't know where it came from. At the same time, in this particular tomb in Talpio, where you find Jesus, son of Joseph, and the name associated with Mary Magdalene and Maria, there's a missing ossuary. Israel Antiquities Authority says, oh, over the weekend, someone stole an ossuary. So if a local worker that was working there stole an ossuary and sold it, and if that's the, if the missing ossuary is the James ossuary, if you put that in the cluster, James, son of Joseph, brother of Jesus, then it's a statistical slam dunk that this is the tomb of Jesus. So uh, our... People didn't notice much, but there was a New York Times article about it. But Professor uh, Dr. Arya Shimron, geologist, um, with a, uh, some colleagues, did a chemist. They did a study of the chemistry of the James ossuary, and it has a unique fingerprint, unique chemical fingerprint because that had been flooding in the tomb, and it matches perfectly the tomb. In Talpiot. So we know what the missing ossuary is. It's the James ossuary. So, you know, uh, I mean, I think there's more evidence for this tomb than, than any other archaeological artifact uh, in the world, frankly. Most stuff that you see in the British Museum doesn't have, doesn't have as much evidence going for it as this particular tomb has. But the reason it doesn't make headlines is because you know, some people, some people have no, some Christians have no problem with the tomb of Jesus. They say, well, I don't think that uh, Jesus physically go went to heaven. He left the earthly body behind. But others feel that this somehow contradicts uh, Christian theology, resurrects. And therefore, it's, this story has been buried, been spiked. Hmm. Why was the James ossuary removed from the tomb? Well, a lot of ossuaries are removed from tombs. Remember, um, if you're if you're a builder, if you're a laborer on a on a on a building site, and you come across a, a tomb, all that stuff in the tomb, oil lamps, glass, perfume uh, gl uh, bottles, ossuaries, ossuaries with inscriptions, ossuaries without inscriptions, ossuaries with some design on them. All that stuff is worth money in the antiquities market. Not big bucks, but some bucks. So if you take one of the artifacts from the tomb 
before the archaeologists get there and or after they've been there but they haven't yet removed everything if you put it in the back of your pickup truck then uh, you've made some money and that happens all the time it is a weird law in israel and that is you know it's illegal to steal stuff from tombs but if you make it across the the finish line like you know in football if you get to, into the end zone, <laughs> the end zone is the the certified authorized antiquities shop if you have a shop and you have and you're recognized and you have a like a certificate that says you're you're allowed to sell antiquities um and i steal something they'll chase me the cops will chase me but if i make it across the threshold in your shop and i sell it to you now it's kosher they can't arrest me and they can't pound what what so so it's a weird law now theoretically you're supposed to be selling stuff that's kind of legally been found but nothing is legally found everything is found in the ground <laughs> and, and you know there's another there's another problem what happens is that if you're a builder you're building a condominium time is money suddenly you're you're uh, uh you know your builders right your tractor has unearthed the tomb oh my god this is bad news for you because now you have to call the israel antiquities authority they don't have enough archaeologists to go around you're going to have to stop building because you're not allowed to destroy archaeology so you have to stop building you gotta wait two three days until the archaeologists show up they map it they photograph it they move the stuff oh my you're losing a lot of money so what happens is that if everybody has seen you find a tomb you you can't break the law you got to call the israel antiquities authority but if it's like seven o'clock in a corner sun has kind of set already and nobody noticed the tomb it's in your interest as a builder to say fill it up with cement get all that stuff out and then they either just flood it with cement and don't report it or the workers take out all the stuff you know the glass the ossuaries everything they sell it they flood it with cement and that's it. Nobody's the wiser. So sometimes what happens is that uh, you go, you know, you go down the streets in old Jerusalem, the market, you enter an antiquity shop and you find amazing things. You go, oh my God, it's amazing, you know, inscription or whatever. And then buyers, you know, people who are in the know, including archaeologists and collectors, uh, buy that stuff and some of this great finds you know like coins uh stamps uh some men mentioning biblical people and um and that's how that's how that missing ossuary from calpio probably made its way into the e into the antiquities market so what was the israel antiquities authorities problem because they they raised it a big ruckus over the tomb and oh did go long and all that what was their deal yeah they raised more of a ruckus over uh Oded Golan. and then the, when it came to the tomb they didn't really give an opinion there was uh, professor james charlesworth of princeton theological seminary organized a, a conference on my film and on my book and the top people got there at the beginning everybody thought that they they would laugh at all our conclusions um, at the end it was a split decision when they voted is it this tomb of jesus they were like a few said no a few said yes and the majority said you got to do you know you got to do more work and since then of course dr shimron has did the work on the james ossuary so um the original problem they had with the james ossuary is that they were embarrassed the collector the when the story came out you, you can't just take antiquities out of israel you need a permission even if you bought it and you own it so you fill out a little thing you know the so the royal ontario museum in toronto wanted to put it on display the james brother of jesus also so the collector he asked for a permit to take it out of the country and when he was given the permit he said what are you taking out he wrote ossuary with inscription 
nobody cared as other authors were inscription. Nobody said what inscription, and they gave him per permission. Next thing you know, that ossuary is in Toronto, and it's front page news all over the world, and people are calling the Israel Antiquities Authority, asking them, what do you think? Is this real? Could this be the ossuary of Jesus? And, and they're caught flat-footed. They don't even know this thing exists, and the New York Times is calling them, asking them their opinion. They got very, very upset. So they rescinded the, uh, the permission to have it abroad. They brought it back. They accused the owner of being a forger. They, they, they impounded the ossuary. It's now back in his hands. They spent years trying to prove it's a forgery. They failed because it's not a forgery. Um, you know, and I think it was ego. I think it was ego. It's like, you're not going to make me look stupid, basically. That was with respect to the James ossuary. With respect to the uh, tomb, it's a different thing. I think there was a lot of pressure on the Israel Antiquities Authority. Remember, they didn't even publish it internally when they found it. They only published it when the BBC crew saw it in, I think, 96. So they published internally an article that said it's meaningless. Uh, so they sat on this story 16 years, not even published, not even abiding by their own rules. So obviously they were covering things up. Why? I think they I know they came under political pressure. Remember, um, the Vatican for Israel, modern Israel was born in 1948. Uh, the Vatican... I think didn't even recognize the state of Israel until the 1960s. So the whole idea of, you know, there was a kind of, the foreign office in Israel basically couldn't care less if this was the tomb of Jesus or not. What they didn't want is to piss off the Vatican or make Christians upset or, and if, even if part of Christian followers got upset with Israel, the whole idea was, do we have that many friends that we want to alienate our friends? So they basically were told, just bury this story. We don't care about it. Just bury it because it'll upset people. So I, I think between ego and political pressure, motivated by fear of um, backlash. Remember, the original, the guy, the first archaeologist uh, to go in, believed that this was the tomb of Jesus. He told his wife so. And he said, I'm not going to report it as such because uh, I'm afraid of an anti-Semitic backlash. It's all in the book. I, I interviewed his widow. She said, he told me, we found the tomb of Jesus. And she said, oh, amazing. Are you going to have a press conference and tell the world? And he said, no, no, because uh, I, I don't need you know, people are just going to get angry at Jews again. Remember, uh, the Holocaust was only over in 1945. And we're talking, you know, if you're talking about 1980, you know, you're talking about 35 years after. It's not that long. It's, you know, people who were, you know, 20 and uh, during the Holocaust are now 55. They remember very well anti-Semitism. Unfortunately, we're seeing it all over the world again. Um, so... So the story was uh, the story was buried along with the tomb. By the way, I'm not out to challenge anybody's faith. I'm a man of I'm a Jew, an Orthodox Jew. I'm a man of faith. I believe in God. I pray three times daily. I certainly am not out to challenge anyone's faith. But I know that for myself, like I did a film about called The Exodus Decoded where I look for the evidence for the biblical exodus. You can find it on YouTube or you can find the exodus decoded. I did that with a famous filmmaker, James Cameron, the avatar. You know, and in that one, we find the evidence for the biblical um, exodus. We find the archeological evidence, the biblical uh, exodus. Now, Maybe some people don't want evidence. They get upset. Why do I need evidence? I'm a person of faith. Okay, that's fine. Uh, if you say that a tsunami split the sea, are you saying it's not God? I say, I'm not saying that at all. God created a tsunami, I'm, you know, or the earthquake or whatever. 
like I see nature as being manip. I don't see a contradiction between science and faith, but that's me. I'm not out there to to undermine anybody's faith. What I am out there is to tell the truth, and I see this very much as important history. It's important history generally to billions of people, and it's important Jewish history. I mean, this is Jewish history. This is a tomb. It's not in Seattle. It's in Jerusalem right it's not in mississippi it's not in rome it's in jerusalem why can't we talk about it and why can't we i look at the evidence and then i try to see how does this match with theology does it undermine it does it does it make me look at the bible in a new way that i didn't understand before i find for me that the the historical the archaeology sheds light on the bible it doesn't undermine it, it sheds light on it. So I'm I'm reporting what they found. There is a tomb in Tel Piot. It's there now. You we would be able to go into it if it hadn't been sealed and barred from anybody entering it. There are ossuaries with the name Jesus Son of Joseph, but they're not put together in a cluster and displayed as the possible ossuaries of of uh, of jesus and his family no one is scraping that ossuary to try to get dna off it you know uh, so really there's two ways to look at this thing one is i'm not going to look at it okay don't look at it but i want to look at it they're both legitimate responses i want to look you don't want to look those are response uh, legitimate what uh, not responsible is I don't want to look and I don't want to let you look either. That's, mm -hmm. that's, I don't like that. So do we, um, uh, do we know at all just, uh, uh, for historical purposes, uh, is it known at all who, who was responsible for removing the ossuary from the tomb or is that not known? You mean the one missing one? Yeah. Is, is it known who took it out of there or, do, or is it not known that's illegal to take one that was uh reported the, mm -hmm. it was found the archaeologists came there they counted all the ossuaries were there when they went in then it was a sabbath just like at the time that jesus mm -hmm. was crucified they came back on the sunday and there was a missing ossuary everybody went home because of the sabbath mm -hmm. kind of put little yellow thing or whatever around the tomb but there was no guard, and somebody came and took to Panasi mm -hmm. Well, thank you for joining me today, Simko Jacobovici. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.